friends, the turnout here is again phenomenal. And we've been going around the country, Mark, I, many others. We've been to Nottingham, Newcastle, Manchester, Sheffield, Bristol. And each and every single one, without exception, has been absolutely packed like this one today. And it's partly down to the organisers, and I think we should cheer, give a big cheers to the organisers. It's partly that, but it's also this. It's the anger and the desperation that exists out there. The biggest party in this country isn't Labour or the Lib Dems or the Tories. The yelling at the TV every time George Osborne appears party. Don't get me wrong, it's a pretty damn big party. But each and every one of us, we've made a decision tonight. We don't just want to be part of that party, though do keep ranting at the TV and radio, it is therapeutic. We want to come out and we want to fight back. We want to stand with other people who have been forced in the same situation as we have. And what we're asking is this. What sort of country do we want to live in? Do we want to live in a country where the only industry booming are food banks? 500,000 people in this country now dependent on them. Do we want to live in a country where Save the Children revealed parents are having to choose between heating their homes and feeding their kids? Where mums and dads are skipping hot meals to make sure their sons and daughters are properly fed? Where schools are cutting back on the skies of lunch portions? Where breakfast clubs are being scrapped. This is the seventh richest country on the face of the earth and apparently we can no longer afford to feed our poorest children. What a damning indictment of austerity Britain. And friends, do you want to live in a country where it remains boom time for the people at the top year after year, the Sunday Times rich list, the top 1,000 people, their wealth has continued to boom whilst in work and out of work benefits have been slashed making working people, unemployed people, disabled people pay for a crisis they have absolutely nothing to do with. Do you want to live in a country? Do you want to live in a country where the desperation, the desperation for work that just does not exist is so intense that when Costa Coffee opened up a shop in Nottingham, they offered eight near minimum wage jobs. 1,701 people applied for those jobs. Do you want to live in a country where our, our National Health Service, and I'm going to quote a Tory now, which I don't make a habit of, but as Nigel Lawson described it, the closest the English have to a religion. That NHS now being privatised by a government that didn't have the guts to put it to the British people, because they know they would have been massacred if they had done so. Do you want to live in a country where the Tories hire Adrian Beecroft, a multi-million pound asset stripper and Tory donor, to strip what remaining rights working people have in this country? He actually had the audacity to call Vince Gable a socialist, which is the worst <laughs> smear against the good name of socialism I've ever heard. My friends, I don't think, I don't think any of us want to live in that country. But that is the country being built by a party who decided to celebrate Mental Health Awareness Week by calling themselves swivel-eyed loons. <laughs> the reality is, they promised a big society, but they're building an ugly and divided society at that. Now, even on their own terms, austerity has been a catastrophe. The underlying deficit goes up, borrowing is soaring, growth has been sucked out of the economy. In fact, we're now in the biggest economic crisis, not since the 80s, not since the 70s. Friends, it's even longer than the Great Depression of the 1930s. But the reality is this. Those aren't even their own terms. What they have done is hijack a financial crisis, a crisis of the market, and they have turned it into a crisis of public spending to push policies they always wanted to push they never thought they could otherwise get away with. Now, what makes, me, what makes me more angry almost about this government than anything, and I realise that's a pretty, pretty big claim, but is this. So the way they tried to redirect people's entirely...
And also we've got a, we've got a crisis over there, which just shows the sort of reality of uh, austerity. But the way this government has tried to redirect people's entirely justifiable anger away from the people at the top who caused this crisis to people's neighbours down the street. Non-disabled people against disabled people, private sector workers against public sector workers, those already living here against immigrants. And it's the same argument each time. You've been mugged, so your less deserving neighbour should be mugged as well. For your low-paid worker, your, your payback has been slashed by your boss, your tax credit slashed by the Tories. Who do they get you to turn on? The scrounger down the road. If you're in the private sector where pensions have been decimated by the bosses, who do they get you to turn your fire on? The nurse next door whose pension is still intact. If you're just struggling to make ends meet, who do they want you to hate? The immigrant down the road who has access to benefits that don't even exist. And friends, this is the age-old policy of divide and rule. And that's where we come in. From all the meetings I've done in the last few months, in the last two years, I've found one thing. There's no shortage of anger out there. There's no shortage of fear. But there's one thing missing, and that's hope. And it was Harvey Milk, the crusading US civil rights campaign, who said this. I know you cannot live on hope alone, but without it, life is not worth living. And the point is this. It doesn't matter how angry people get. It doesn't matter how scared people get, they don't have hope, they don't fight back, they yell at their TV screens, their hatred may be redirected against their neighbours, but they don't fight back. And that is why we have to give people hope. And I just want to talk quickly about how I think we can give that hope. Firstly, to give a voice to people who've otherwise been airbrushed out of existence. What this government have done, and their allies in the media, is to airbrush out of existence all of those who are being hammered by this crisis. We have to give a platform to those people, the people across the country being made to pay for this crisis. But we also do this. We give a coherent alternative. Now I want to talk quickly about what we can be talking about on the streets, in our communities, in our workplaces. Now we always hear by this government time and time again that welfare spending is too high. And it's shocking now. They've got a point. It's not to do with a bunch of lazy scroungers dribbling on sofas in mansions made out of widescreen television sets watching Jeremy Kyle on repeat with 50 fellow kids running amok. It's for three reasons. It's a housing crisis, it's a low wages crisis, and it's a jobs crisis. Now, people have absolutely every reason to be furious about the £23 billion of taxpayers' money now being wasted on housing benefit. That's not lining the pockets of the tenant. It's lining the pockets of private landlords so charging <laughs> the What we say is this, as well as controlling rents, give councils the freedom to build housing, creating jobs, stimulating the economy, bringing down the five million young social housing waiting list and the £23 billion housing benefit bill too. Now tax credits a lifeline for millions. But let's be clear about what they are. They're a subsidy for low pay because bosses aren't paying their workers for You've stopped spending billions on tax credits and in-work benefits like housing benefit. Bear in mind, 93% of new claimants are people in work. And instead, we put money in people's pockets where they spend it. And again, the unemployment crisis. We're spending billions of pounds on the fact people can't get work. So let's have an industrial strategy to create hundreds of thousands of renewable energy jobs, taking on the environmental crisis and the drug crisis at the same time. Well, that's just this as well. We hear about benefit fraud every single other day. Now, it does exist. Less than 1% of welfare spending, £1.2 billion a year. Compare that to £25 billion every year lost because the people at the top are not paying their taxes. The likes of Amazon, Google, of Starbucks, of Sir Philip Green, 
who has registered his company under his wife's name in Monaco, so he doesn't have to pay taxes. Now, he didn't get attacked as morally deviant or however Jimmy Carr was attacked by the Prime Minister. He was made an advisor on how to slash our public services. So we call for an all-out war against tax avoidance by the people at the top and demand they have to pay their taxes. be honest about what happened. We nationalised the debt and we privatised the profit. We the taxpayer bailed them out but we have no control over what they do. So we the people who bailed them out, we demand public control of the banks to rebuild our economy. <laughs> this isn't wacky stuff. It's not stuff outside of whatever they call the mainstream. These are common sense ideas. That instead of making people who have nothing to do with this crisis pay for it, we use a crisis to change society in the interests of working people. That is where the People's Assembly comes in. And I know many of you, maybe I'm making this up or I've misjudged the mood, but some of you, when you heard about this, would have thought, oh, here we go again. Here's another failed project that will come crashing down. People are nodding. So I haven't misjudged the mood. <laughs> <laughs> but this is why this is different. Firstly, the sheer breadth of what we are doing. This is something which now has the backing of unions representing millions of private and public sector workers, of the Green Party, of Labour activists, of people fighting for disabled people, young people, for tax justice, and more importantly than all, in a way, people with no political home whatsoever. But there's also something else, and I've noticed this mood change. Before, years ago, there was almost a sense that those who wanted a better world could almost afford to fall out with each other. But we don't have that luxury anymore. None of us, we won't all agree on everything, and in a way that should be a strength. Debate and discussion should always be a strength of any mass movement. But we do it on the basis that we're all on the same side. We're all fighting against the same common enemy. And I think that is what's going to change. And I just want to talk before I wrap up of what gives me hope, what shows it is possible to fight back. Last year I went to speak to bin workers in Leeds. They went on strike against their council in 2009, a Lib Dem Tory coalition before it was all the rage. Now tried to cut their wages by a third. Now they went on strike for nine weeks. Freezing cold weather, it was winter, they got up every day and manned those picket lines at 5am. And they won. I'll give you another example. The electricians who took on Balfour Beatty, a huge multinational company, and they won. Yeah. And another example, we tax avoidance. Who the hell, three years ago, except for people on the fringes, was talking about tax avoidance? No one until people occupied shops and businesses. UK Uncut came along. Now everybody is talking about it. And one more example. Now a lot of you aren't going to believe I was actually there at the time. But the movement against the poll tax. Now I was at five years old, I'll have you know. <laughs> I've heard all the jokes, so don't, don't try. <laughs> and I was taking my parents to Glasgow. The poll tax march there I actually started a chant. You think of precocious now. And the point was this. People at the time thought about Thatcher. We can't beat. We can't beat a government. She took on the miners and won, and people thought, you can take the miners on, no one can win. But not only did they end the poll tax, they helped boot Margaret Thatcher out of number 10. Just to sum up, my favourite quote is Frederick Douglass, a 19th century African-American statesman and a freed slave, and he said this, Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. And the point is this, the way we get change isn't through the goodwill and generosity of those above, it's through the struggle and sacrifice of people from below. People who put aside minor differences to join together with people they have shared interests with to fight back. Having the flame of anger, as Tony Benn puts it, the flame of anger and the flame of hope that not only can we take on austerity, not only can we take on this government, 
But we can help build a new society in the interests of working people. We stand together. We fight together. Friends, we will win this together.